This podcast is also sponsored by Kadan Kadan. Kadan Kadan is a new groupage app that allows you to share space within a shipping container so that you can save costs when it comes to your logistics and transportation. Visit kadankadank.com to learn more or visit the Instagram page Kadankadan Official. Rush, like, okay. okay. So, good morning, everyone. This is Malobi from the Kadan Kadan podcast. And today I am joined by Keith from Vita to Grow Urban Farms. I'm really excited about this one because it's our first guest from Zimbabwe. So uh, I, I love the country. I've seen some videos of it online. Um, it's got an interesting history and, and you know things going on there. So I'm sure Keith can share with us the environment he's operating in. So um, Keith, welcome to the podcast. How, how are you doing today? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for having me on. I'm so excited. I've uh, watched your podcast uh, quite a lot and I've been following it quite avidly. So it was an honor when you guys uh, reached out to me. Uh, but I'm good. Eh? How are you doing that side? Um, I'm doing fantastic. I'm doing fantastic, you know. Um, thank you. Thank you for the kind words as well. So uh, I'm, I'm really, like I said, I'm really interested in this one because I want to visit Zimbabwe. There's a lot of interesting things going on there, but I know there's also challenges in, in, in the economy. So um, just to get a top level for those people that don't know much about um, Zimbabwe, can you just tell us a little bit about, not necessarily the history, because people could do their own research, but in terms of how um, what, what, how the economy affects businesses like yours um, operating, you know, say someone wants to invest in Zimbabwe, can you tell us a bit about the operating environment? Uh, okay, all right, thanks for that. So... Uh, right now in Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe is a country in the southern African region, obviously. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, over the last few years, we've had some, over the last few decades, I'd say, we've had some challenges with our economy. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, some issues going on with our economy, with our currency, and certain things like that. Uh, but then over the last few years, look, uh, things have been improving somewhat, I would say. And then so definitely for a startup and for someone who wants to start their business, it is a bit harder in, a, uh, in an environment like, for example, let's say that's plagued with inflation. So it is kind of hard for you to plan a business and run a business, but it's very doable. And like I said, over the last few years, it has been improving somewhat. So you know, that's the environment uh, we've been working in, but we've managed to thrive in it and we, you know, hope to continue to thrive in it as things improve and take advantage of everything that we've learned. Fantastic, fantastic. Well said. Um, okay, so let's let's get into it. Um, tell us a little bit about Vitagrow. What is Vitagrow? What do you guys do? Um, and how does it work? Okay, so Vitagrow is a hydroponic company. So what's hydroponics? Uh, hydroponics is a soilless method of farming. So in essence, we don't use soil to farm. Uh, we use mainly water and other grow medium to grow our crops. And uh, hydroponics has uh, different benefits compared to normal soil-based farming because everyone will be like, look, uh, we are used to farming in the soil. Why then should we say, you know, let's not use the soil, what's wrong with the soil? So basically just a quick rundown, uh, hydroponics helps because uh, there's a lot of diseases and pests that go into soil. Like when you're farming using soil, right? So with hydroponics, we don't use any soil, which means we uh, run away from all those diseases. And we also have various benefits. So for example, you save up to 90% of water usage uh, by using hydroponics because uh, all the water recirculates. So uh, you also save uh, up to half the size of space compared to planting on the ground because we can also grow vertically. I'm not sure if you've seen any of our systems or any hydroponic systems that are growing vertically. Basically, it's when you utilize you know, the vertical plane instead of going horizontally, which requires a lot of space, you actually grow vertically, which means you can grow more crops in a smaller space. So why is some of these things uh, important is like you mentioned in an environment like Zimbabwe or most of the countries in Africa, uh, there are certain places where there's certain issues, uh, things like water availability. Uh, with farming, obviously you need require a lot of water. So <clears throat> with the increased you know, uh, globalization and a lot of uh, 
you know, population boom that's been happening, there tends to be a lot more people around, which means we have to conserve our environment a bit more. So water becomes a bit more scarce and the methods that we use for farming should reflect this part that we're taking. So with hydroponics, because of the benefits I mentioned, it really does, you know, uh, help the environment as well. And another important thing with hydroponics that uh, we really like uh, as a company is the benefits to the environment. So because there's no tilling and there's no, uh, <clears throat> you know, digging of the soil, we actually leave the environment and the soil like that for future generations. Because I'm not sure if you're aware, but when you farm, you're actually degrading the soil. So for example, if you have a piece of land and then you farm over that same piece of land for, I don't know, let's say five to 10 years, uh, after that time, the, that soil is going to be less fertile. And then the, you know, our future generations and everything will now have, uh, will inherit a more depleted uh, you know, natural resource. So with hydroponics, because we don't use any soil, we're actually saving the environment and uh, doing our part to you know, uh, securing uh, the future generations' uh, natural resources. Fantastic, that's, uh, that's Hydroponics 101 right there. I love that. Love that. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so some questions that immediately come to mind, which other people might have is like, okay, it doesn't have, there's no soil. So does that mean it doesn't have as many nutrients inside? So that's actually one of the first things that uh, uh, many people ask, you know, you know, are they GMOs? You know, how do you mm. grow without, uh, without soil? So just a quick rundown. What happens is uh, when you look at the, you know, the growth cycle of a plant, right? You need various factors for a plant to grow, right? What you need is you need water. You need nutrition, you need carbon dioxide, you know, uh, sunlight, uh, nutrients, things like that, right? So traditionally, uh, the, the nutrients from uh, the plant, right, gets nutrients from the soil. And then obviously people add more fertilizers to, you know, to boost the nutrition, right? So what hydroponics is, is we haven't missed, you know, we don't mess with anything else. Uh, what, all we do is like, for example, take an example of a, a you know, a, a tree. Okay, a tree for it to grow, it needs so much, you know, nitrogen, so much, you know, uh, phosphorus, things like that, right? So with hydroponics, what they've done is they've done tests, right, in the soil and with the fertilizers and come up with what exactly does this tree need to grow? Right. So this is the nutrients and micronutrients that we're talking about. So what then they've done is then we make a fertilizer, right, with all these necessary uh, nutrition, right, uh, nutritional uh, benefits. And then that fertilizer is just made soluble. So soluble is just that it dissolves in water, right. And then when we feed our plants with the water, that's how they take up. The, the nutrients, right? So definitely uh, with hydroponics, it actually has, your plant actually has access to more nutrients than in the soil. Because what we do is we have a reservoir or a tank where the water circulates back into. So in this reservoir, that's where we have our nutrients and we actually have special meters that we can measure how much nutrients are in that water. So as the water goes through the plant throughout the day, throughout the week, right? It depletes certain nutrients. And then we always come and check what's been depleted and then top it up. So in a nutshell, that's really what hydroponics is. It's just a different method of feeding the plant, but everything else is the same. The plant will still need uh, carbon dioxide. It will still need uh, sunlight, you know, everything else that a plant needs. All we've done is we've removed the soil aspect and then replaced it with a nutrient rich solution that uh, mm -hmm. the plant can absorb. Okay, okay. This is this is very interesting, actually. Um, and, and another question that comes to mind is, um, okay, you, it sounds like because you're not doing it out in nature, it's probably going to cost a little bit more to set up, I'm just assuming. So does that mean that um, hydroponically farmed products are more expensive or, um, and maybe are they, are they, the second question to that would be, is it only profitable in like a city area? Okay, so uh, I think for your first question, right, one of the main uh, barriers with hydroponics is definitely the initial setup costs, because you use a lot of pipes, pumps, and material that you wouldn't uh, normally use in a traditional farming setting, right, so your, your initial cost is going to definitely be higher, right, but then the benefit is over time you're running costs, 
are going to actually be lower than actually uh, than the soil based farmer. This is because of the benefits that I mentioned. Some of the benefits that I mentioned, like uh, reduced water uh, usage, obviously water pumping, water costs uh, money and things like that. Also space. The less space you have, the less labor you also need, right? Uh, also things like fertilizers, you don't waste fertilizers because when you put fertilizers in the ground, you do have the risk of leaching or having them washing away, right? But because all our uh, fertilizers recirculate, that means we actually save and use less fertilizers. So definitely that's one of the main barriers that people uh, face when they want to enter into hydroponics. Another barrier obviously is uh, that ideally you want to do hydroponics uh, to get the full benefits of hydroponics. Uh, it would be better if you do it in a controlled environment or semi-controlled environment, right? So i.e. a greenhouse, for example. So if you put it in a greenhouse, that means that you are actually reaping more of the benefits of hydroponics. Some people can actually grow it outside. We actually do some tests. Uh, we are running some tests and we've been running some tests on growing it outside versus inside, but definitely growing it inside uh, as a, you know, the main benefit, but again, the cost of erecting a greenhouse is something that also, you know, hinders many people from entry. And then uh, in terms of hydroponics actually being implemented only in the cities. So one of the main factors of hydroponics is because of this cost, right? Uh, people, it tends to be more viable uh, or lean towards horticultural production. Right, because with horticulture, you actually produce more with less plants. Right, so I'll give you an example like for uh, a tomato plant, right? You can have one plant and that uh, can give you, you know, many kgs, right? Like uh, from that one plant throughout, you know, a four to five month cycle, right? Whereas if you're doing other crops like, you know, uh, wheat, uh, maize, things like that, right? You need a vast amount of produce, right? So if you want to implement right now, as we are currently, if you want to implement hydroponics, it's, you know, better suited towards our horticulture. And mainly horticulture is mainly pra, sorry, practiced in urban areas, right? That's where your tomatoes, your, you know, lettuce, your cucumbers are mainly consumed, right? So right now, that's why you'd find hydroponics more in the urban areas than the rural areas. But I believe the more, you know, the more, people understand hydroponics more, the more tests happen, the more, you know, collaborations happen with governments or uh, with bodies uh, like that, right? More and more hydroponic produce is gonna start being developed in the rural areas as well. Very interesting. And, and you actually leading into a question I was gonna ask about um, the types of products um, you mentioned horticulture. So what kind of, um, products does VitaGrow Urban Farms actually offer through the hydroponic farming? And also onto that, what are the other interesting products that could be for people that are maybe looking into this kind of business? Um, which, which other ones could be profitable? Okay, so right now uh, what we do is we mainly focus in uh, lettuces. So that's fancy lettuces, your you know, uh, because of our market, our market is mainly targeted towards restaurants, hotels, supermarkets, and, you know, farmers markets, but mainly restaurants and hotels. So it's more of a niche market. So they use a lot of fancy, you know, lettuce varieties. So we do quite a lot of varieties like that. We also do English cucumbers, we do cherry tomatoes, we do strawberries, herbs, uh, edible flowers, microgreens, and sprouts, right? So that's the type of you know uh, <clears throat> produce that we specialize in. However, you can also do different other crops for anyone who's also interested in getting into hydroponics. Like I mentioned, hydroponics is just a method of feeding. So you know, technically, you can do any crop you want, right? The only thing that will hinder you is just the viability of your uh, project, right? Uh, so the viability would mean how much money you'd need to invest and how much money you would get back. So mainly that's the barrier that but you can grow anything. You can grow trees, you can grow blueberries. Uh, a lot of people do blueberries, mm. right? You can do things like saffron. I'm not sure if you're uh, familiar with mm -hmm. saffron. It's uh, one of the world's most expensive spices and it's actually creating the market these days, especially in Dubai, places like that, right? Uh, so one could look at that to specifically start and specialize in that. 
But for us right now, uh, where we are in Harare, we are mainly focusing on those crops that I mentioned. Wow, this is this is so interesting, but also um, niche as well. So I'm, I'm kind of thinking like, what made you decide to get into hydroponics? Did you kind of just fall into it or what's the story behind that? So obviously there's always a story behind everything, right? I'll just give you a small rundown of how I got to where I am and how Fire to Grow got to how it is. So uh, I did my university in, after finishing my high school, I, was, I learned here from primary to high school here in Harare. And then after finishing my high school, I went to university in China, right? That's where I did my degree, funny enough, in banking and finance. But uh, yeah, I'd never been a farmer. I'd never really, you know, liked farming, to be honest. Uh, I like numbers and I, I'm good at numbers. And that's what I really liked from a young age, right? So when I went to school uh, in, uh, in university, then I finished, uh, I you know, initially I taught English there in China for a few years. You know, obviously there's this perception that, you know what, I don't want to go back home. You know, things are tough back home. There's no jobs for me, blah, blah. And, you know, when you're watching social media, social media is one of those things that actually can dampen your spirit. It's a very good thing, but it's, it can go both ways. It can be a benefit and it can also be a curse. So I've met other, a lot of people you know, who I learned with, and, you know, have met throughout my time are so scared to come back to their countries because of what they see and you know from you know other worlds <laughs> western worlds things like that right so for me i you know i tried it i was like no let me so in china one of the main jobs that you can do or the easiest jobs you can do is to teach english right so i taught english all the way from kindergarten to uh, uh, to university even right and it was good but then for me there was just always something you know, I didn't really know what I wanted to do, but I knew that that was not it. You know, I mean, life was okay. You know, you get a good salary, everything. But for me, I just always thought that, look, I want something different, but I didn't know what. So in 2018, I just decided finally, after teaching for like three years, I think, I just decided finally, let me, you know what, let me go back home. Let me just go and see, and you know, other people are there. <laughs> Why can't I go back? And then I just dropped everything. Basically, I quit, and then I came back home. So at first, like I said, I didn't know what I was, what I wanted to do. I started applying for a lot of banking jobs, business jobs, and the funny thing is, in an economy, in a, in one of these, uh, like in Africa, right? In most economies that are struggling in Africa, right? You'd find that most people do business degrees. <laughs> it's actually quite funny right <laughs> uh because you should actually be since the economy isn't performing so well you should actually be looking at you know different types of uh you know uh, degrees that are just not what everyone's doing but you know so i fell into that pool i had a lot of people so you know when you submit cvs everyone's got the same you know degree and so it was very hard for me to get a job right so I just got kind of frustrated with the whole thing and I could see that even if I do find the job because of the sheer number of people uh, who have the same qualifications, I'll probably start at the bottom, then I'd have to do another seven years or something before I can reach somewhere you know, respectable. So what I did was, uh, because I had saved up a little bit of money, I started sort of trying out different projects. Again, in an economy like Zimbabwe's, the entrepreneurship or you know project businesses is, is what everyone now just turns to so you know your friend is like oh look i'm growing chickens or i'm doing this i'm doing that someone is doing mining everyone's like look why don't you do something as well while you wait so i just started a couple of projects failed projects i'd say uh thank goodness they failed <laughs> because uh, to be honest i didn't really like them uh, but yeah, then towards the end, after I'd almost spent all my money, uh, a friend uh, mentioned uh, greenhouse farming to just out of passing. And then I was like, ah, okay, let me just check it. So then I checked it in a nutshell. I sort of thought, look, this is something that I could do. So I was still staying at my parents' house since I had just gotten back. And we had quite a big backyard that was underutilized, right? So I asked my mom, look, mom, can I please erect one greenhouse there and just, you know, grow some veggies? Uh, so, you know, she agreed uh, eventually. And then I put up uh, my greenhouse, with my close to last money that I had, <laughs> right? And then started, uh, you know, just farming on my own and stuff. And obviously, as I always say, I was failing because I was not a farmer, but I had and I didn't really know what I was doing. But 
what that gave me is that gave me that hope and realization that look, you don't really have to work for anyone. You can actually be your own boss and you can actually make a living and support yourself from things that you do by yourself. Because uh, one of the issues that I that I one of the issues that I see with the education sector uh, in most places, especially in Africa, is it's not geared towards entrepreneurship. It's actually geared towards you, you know, working for someone. Right, be it, uh, look, I'm going to be a doctor, an accountant, you know, of which, look, there's nothing wrong with that, but not everyone can be a doctor, right? Uh, there needs to be people who start their own businesses, who, you know, employ people, create employment. So as I was growing up, I never really knew this, but once I started that first greenhouse, it really, you know, hit me and told to me that, look, there is a life outside working for someone and it can actually be productive. Then from then on, uh, <clears throat> But I was doing it in the ground, by the way, uh, because I hadn't found out about hydroponics. And then um, I've got a cousin of mine who's, uh, who's based in the United States, uh, sorry, United Kingdom. And then she came over one holiday, she saw what I was doing, and she really liked it. She's a nurse there in the UK. And then she was like, look, I think what you're doing is cool. I would also like to join you if that's okay. So I was like, ah, look, that's great. And then she introduced me to uh, one of her friends as well, who's a banker there in the uh, United Kingdom as well. And then he also liked uh, what you know we were trying to do and everything. And then he also joined us. So then it was three of us, and then we formed formally formed Fire to Grow Urban Farmers, right? And then from then on, throughout the year, uh, then we came across hydroponic farming uh, by chance again, you know, just researching and stuff. Then I Googled around, checked, and then I, uh, I found that there was a lady uh, who had a company here in Zimbabwe, who's got a company in Zimbabwe, who did training for hydroponic, uh, who did hydroponic courses. So I attended one of her first courses, and I really liked it. And then we discussed, discussed, and we thought, look, this makes sense for us. This is the direction we want to go. And then we started converting our whole operation into a hydroponic operation. And then throughout, the following years, we have, uh, you know, uh, we've gained some partners as well. Uh, we've partnered with this company called Telecontract uh, in Zimbabwe. I'm going to speak a bit more about the technology a bit later on. But one of the main things that we want to do with hydroponics is to use agritech. Uh, I'm sure, as you can see, technology is becoming more and more you know, widely used in many different things in the world and technology actually helps with uh, advancement and, you know, making things a bit more <clears throat> proof, right? Getting things like getting higher yields and things like that. So hydroponics and technology go hand in hand. So we partnered with this uh, uh, telecontract company called Telco here in Zimbabwe and they've now become a partner of Vitagro and we are working towards creating uh, technological systems that will aid people who are doing hydroponic farming, things like sensors, automations, the, the works. So currently, that's how Vitagro looks as a company. Wow, this is that's a really interesting uh, story. <laughs> from from you know teaching in China to trying different businesses to partnering with people, um, it's really interesting. So do you speak Chinese? Or uh, yes, I do. Yes, I oh, do. Oh wow. It's been, I was there for I think around seven years, but now I've been out of there for like another seven. So I do speak Chinese now. It was one of the wow. was this sort of flip in China. That's crazy. That's crazy. I know. I know it's not easy to learn. So that's that's impressive. Um, and you you said a couple of interesting things there, like you know our educational system uh, in Africa is not necessarily geared towards entrepreneurship, and uh, you know, and and I think it's the previous generation as well. You know parents always wanting their kids as well to be like, I mean, if I can speak for Nigeria, you know, they want a lawyer, a doctor, uh, yeah. you know, the old, but I think that the tides is changing a little bit. I don't know about Zimbabwe, but in Nigeria, at least there's a very big, you know, like entrepreneurship community. Everyone's trying to get into tech or um, agribusiness, not, not necessarily agribusiness, tech and other things. So um, it's, it's good to see that that's kind of changing. Um, and before I, I kind of, you know, to talk about um, the, the partnerships, which I think is probably one of the key parts of that story, um, I wanted to talk about um, when you moved back and you said you tried different things and, and, and they didn't quite work out. 
are there any key um, lessons that you learned from some of those things? Because I think uh, sometimes we, we tend to skip over the, 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 the things that don't kind of work out, but I think people can really learn and, and avoid those same mistakes. So I don't know if there's anything that kind of sticks out to you in terms of like, okay, definitely don't do that <laughs> for people maybe in Zimbabwe or elsewhere to, to learn from your mistakes. Okay, so I would say from my experiences, what I learned is, you know, it's very hard to tell someone. What I learned is you need to fail in order to succeed. Right? So the first thing is don't be scared to fail because through every failure, basically you're not going to do the same thing again. And then it subconsciously builds in your mind, right? That look, even if you fail at something five years before, your mind still has it registered. So even without you actually thinking about it, you know, you would do better than you did then. So that's the first thing that, look, just go for it. If you have the means or if you have, you know, just get off uh, the couch and, you know, try something, right? And then, so that's the first thing, right, that you need. And then what I would also say is never try to emulate other people. Right. So one of the things that I've seen, especially in economies where, you know, things are not really working out a bit, there are always those people who have things that are working or that seem to be working. Right. So that also puts pressure on a lot of the youth to try things. And then that's how people become a bit more reckless and get you know, either scammed or, you know, uh, pulled into investments that don't really make sense. So what I would say is do your research first. Right before you enter into anything, right? Do your thorough research. Don't just take someone's word for it. Because like I said, I would have a friend who comes and be driving a nice car, for example. And he's like, look, I'm into gold mining. <laughs> I'm into whatever it is, right? Uh, it's, you know, bring me a few thousand dollars. Let's invest. And that can be like you. And bing, already you're like, ah, oh, this guy, it's working. It must be working, right? And then you go, you invest in something that you've got completely no idea about you don't really like, you know, and that's the third thing that I'm going to uh, say that I've learned that try to find something that you can see yourself doing, you know, for a very long time, because a lot of the time, a lot of people ask me like, oh, you know, this must be such a hard venture that you're doing, you must be so smart, you know, but I'm like, no, it's not that I'm smart, or it's not that many people who are entrepreneurs are smart, it's just that they found something that they like. Right. If you do something that you like, your chances of success, you know, are boosted like, you know, exponentially. Right. Even if you know nothing about it, like I said, I started farming and I knew nothing about farming. Right. But uh, because uh, farming combined all of the certain aspects that, you know, the certain skills that I possessed. Right. It all just came together to create this one thing. So for me, I think those are the three wow. lessons that I learned. Don't be scared to do something, right? Go and fail. The second thing is, although you shouldn't be scared, but also just be careful and do your research, right? So that you just don't, because many people, you know, we don't have, especially at that age, you don't have unlimited resources, right? Uh, to spread around and fail 20 times, right? Someone would fail two times, and maybe their third failure was going to be, or the third venture was going to be what's, what's going to, you know, but because of funding, then from then on, they don't have any more chances. So just try to do a bit more research uh, on that. And then third thing is try to find something that you like and, you know, you'll see the miracles working in the background and you'll be a success. Wow, that's, that's fantastic. Uh, some very wise words there. And uh, I completely um, agree with each and every one of them, um, especially the one about something that you like. Because like you said, you might not even know anything about the industry, but you, because you're passionate about it, you want to learn, you just, you just get learning and learning. And before you know it, people start thinking, oh my God, this guy is so intelligent <laughs> like there's just you know you just you just cared you just cared enough to learn you know um okay and 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 also i wanted to talk about um your your partnerships because another issue is sometimes people always kind of not everyone but a lot of people want to do things by themselves they want to do things alone and but you know you said a lady came down from the uk partnered with her another person partnered with him and then there's this tech technology company partnered with them so um what, what's kind of your, your, your partnership look like? Is it kind of, do you have different roles within the organization? Uh, maybe you're more operational and she's more, you know, funding or this and that. Like what's, what's kind of the partnership looking like? 
okay so uh first of all our partnership is you know just like with any other partnership uh partnerships are very delicate right the like you mentioned i'll start where you mentioned and there's a lot of people who always recommend against partnerships right they say look you started something you know this is wonderful you know you started it it should be yours you know why are you sharing with someone especially you know sharing it with people with more you know uh, you know more finance than you right there's always this fear that people are going to take your idea take your business and you know things like that right but then for me what i sort of realized early maybe it was from my time in china because in china i did also try out various little businesses and stuff right on my own right so what i quickly realized was look uh, we can take certain examples like you know facebook things like that that's what everyone always uses right and says look uh, you know this person would own most of it and stuff right but the thing is you have to look at your own situation as a person right and realize that look although you do have a good idea you've got the drive you've got everything right you've got the vision right you definitely do need to have the vision of where you want to go right even still quite early on in the business right but you need to realize that you know where can i get this business to and where can having someone else join me get this business to right a lot of people are too stuck on keeping you know for yourself and saying look i don't want to share with anyone but if you look at a lot of companies that go public that you know things like that they have investors they have board members you know shareholders and things like that right and that's how they got to what they got to right if you're lucky enough to be you know uh <clears throat> financially blessed right you have a lot of money then for sure go for it but for me like i said i was just coming from university i didn't have anything so maybe i could have got invited to go to where it is right now just by myself but it would have taken me way way longer right to get to where i want to be so i decided that look uh not that that's how it is but it's better to own a certain percentage of uh you know a hundred million dollar company <laughs> or you can own hundred percent of a thousand dollar company right so that's the way i saw things that look uh, if i bring in people with the certain skills that i need or that the business needs we can actually get to where we want to get to quicker and faster and you know in business it's all about thing you can't run a business for 12 years or 15 years without you know, seeing results, right? There's a lot of fatigue that goes in, trends change, things change. So when you have an idea, I believe that you have to hit the iron while it's hot. And the easiest way to do it or the best and most efficient way to do it is to partner with people, right? Uh, albeit the right type of people, right? So I was lucky enough to, no, I was blessed enough. I won't come and say, you know, I'm a genius, you know, hey, blah, 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 right? I was blessed enough to meet these people uh, the, uh, that then became my partners, right? And the nice thing is, as people, first of all, before my partners, they were actually very supportive of what I was trying to do, even before all of them joined me. So that also gave me the confidence to actually push through and head it. And then that leaves, uh, that leads now to our role. So, the role right now is I'm the one who's so like I've got two partners in the UK and then I've partnered with my uh, these two uh, <clears throat> sorry this uh, this this company over here in Zimbabwe right so in terms of operational things I'm the head uh, of operations so I head all the operations day to day things you know staff growing all those things uh, innovations and building new hydroponic systems designing new hydroponic systems etc right and then uh, we've got uh, other people who do finance strategy marketing you know technological advancements things like that so it's a whole sort of uh, team where everyone has their role that they perform in order to get the business to where we all want it to be but then uh, right now, like I mentioned, I'm the head of, I'm on the operational side. And then I bring together everyone else together and then, you know, around the growing or the core. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. You're kind of like in the, in the, in the middle, like the glue that yeah. binds everything together. So that's, that's amazing. Um, okay. So uh, before we kind of round up, I wanted to 
um, talk about the, the technology. Um, also, before, before we jumped on, you said that, you know, you guys are launching a new product. So can you talk a little bit more about that sort of tech um, enabled side of the business? Okay. So when we did start, obviously, the core of the business of how Vitrigo is structured is it's growing. Right? So we grow produce and then we sell to you know, restaurants, hotels, supermarkets, and various outlets, right? That's our core business. Every business needs a core in order to pay the bills, get everything running, right? And then uh, from the core, what we also do is uh, we do hydroponic training sessions. So we hold two sessions every month at our site where someone comes and then, you know, if someone's interested, they can come for a training day or a tour, right? And then what we also do is... Uh, like how the technology then comes uh, into play. So like I mentioned, the initial setup cost of hydroponics is it's quite, it's quite high. So what we thought over the years was because we used to buy hydroponic systems from you know, South Africa, China, you know, all over, right? But the cost was very exorbitant, right? So we realized that for people uh, you know, in Zimbabwe or in Harare, right, who actually want to start hydroponics, once they hear of those costs, you know, they're out of the game, <laughs> they're already like, no, we're, we don't want, right? So what we did is we started making our own systems using locally sourced materials, right? So what this does is, especially, for example, during COVID times, right, if you rely on everything to come outside the country, like what happened, uh, you know, globally, you'd be in trouble because you can't bring anything in and your business, you know, many businesses died during COVID because of that, right? So... Also, so we now design and build our own hydroponic systems using locally sourced material. This has obviously uh, reduced the costs of the build, which means we can offer hydroponic systems to people at lower costs, right? Which then uh, lowers that barrier of entry to anyone wanting to do hydroponics, right? And then besides that, right, our vision now is to outlay all those systems with technology. Like we mentioned, technology, there's a lot of different factors that affect, uh, you know, how a business or if, is, okay, from a farming perspective, okay, how a farm or a business, uh, you know, what are the chances of success, right? For example, if you have a one hectare farm and you've got maize on it, right, that's a lot of, you know, space, right? A lot of time people don't get the right yields because of things like human error, right, miscalculations, or they just don't have the you know, the finance to spray all the crops and things like that. So people end up taking shortcuts. So one way to mitigate some of those things is to control as much of the external environment as you can, right? So if you think about it, a plant only reacts to stimulus, right? So if the sun is there, it'll grow. You know, if there are no pests, it'll grow healthy. If you give it nutrition, it'll grow, things like that, right? So with hydroponics and agri-tech, the direction that we're trying to take and this approach has been taken, you know, uh, has been uh, getting used for quite a lot of decades in the West, you know, things like that, right? But we are now trying to bring it to Africa and to Zimbabwe, right? Where you control as much of the external environment as you can, right? Once you do that, your chances of success or your chances of this one plant reaching maturity and giving you the yields that you expect are now exponentially higher. Right, so the way to do that is by using technology. So uh, what we do is we outlay all our greenhouses or grow houses with sensors, special sensors that uh, sense uh, <clears throat> uh, chosen variables that we've decided. Things like temperature, the grow room temp temperature affects how your crop grows. If you've seen in winter, in most places or in very cold places, you can't really grow good crops because of things like frost and things like that, right? But in a greenhouse, you know, we are sort of mitigating a bit against that, right? Because it's warmer in a greenhouse, right? And obviously if it gets too hot as well, so there's two extremes, right? So temperature is an important variable towards growing. Things like humidity, if it's too humid in a place or in a greenhouse, you get a lot of diseases, uh, things like that, right? Or if it's too, you know, on both spectrums, things like <clears throat> uh, light availability, right? Sunlight availability, there's places like, for example, Alaska, I don't think you can grow anything because there's uh, basically no sun there, right? And crops need sun. So by these sensors measure all these various, uh, you know, variables that we've identified. And then it's all fed into a dashboard, 
like that you can access on your phone or laptop, right? So you, where I'm sitting or wherever I am, even if I'm in town or even in another country, because everything is outlaid with Wi-Fi. So they're always online. So I can actually check and see that, okay, greenhouse one, the temperature right now is this. So it's a bit too hot. Let's do something about it. Or it's a bit too cold. Let's do something about it, right? And then the next phase, obviously, is to automate. So, for example, that greenhouse one, right? So you said that, look, uh, it needs to get to a certain temperature. You know that we are growing English cucumbers, for example. The temperature should not get above 28 degrees or 25 degrees, depending on the variety that you're growing, right? So you'd program the sensors that, look, once it gets you know, above 25 degrees Celsius, right, you switch on the fans automatically, like there's fans in the greenhouses, things like that, dehumidifiers for humidity, you know, things like that, right? You switch it on, and then when the temperature drops, you know, below that again, switches off, so that you maintain a certain temperature or temperature range for all your grow houses, right? And that means that your yields, your expected yields are going to be closer to your calculations, right? Because like I mentioned, a lot of people go into a business and say, I'm not sure about Nigeria, but if you go and ask an agronomist right now, they'll tell you, look, you can, if you go, you plant this, use this, you know, thing that we give you the program, you're going to get so much yeah, tons per hectare, for example, but almost always you never get <laughs> that, right? Yeah, yeah. these consultants. <laughs> definitely, definitely, right? So mostly 90 something percent of it, of the time, right? You don't get those yields. And it's because you've got no way of controlling the environment around your crops. So with technology, basically, that's what we are trying to do and offer solutions, firstly, for fire to grow. And then obviously, uh, now we can out, uh, sell to other people who want to do hydroponic farming as well. And everything will be linked to our central dashboard. And then we automate everything like nutrient uh, dosages. Remember I mentioned how we measure our nutrients and make sure that the crop always has that, like a specific crop always has the specific uh, recommendation of nutrients and things like that. So by using technology, we can actually say in this reservoir, you know, make sure that the fertilizer, the nutrients, sorry, don't fall below a certain level. Once they do, top them up and things like that. And definitely that will have great benefits towards the plants as well. So in a nutshell, oh. that's how we plan to use technology at Vitago. And the, especially doing it, uh, you know, uh, we have this motto of our saying African by design for Africa in Africa, right? So like I said, there are many places where you could probably get these things off the shelf, but they're expensive. And I've noticed that some of the things that we buy or are sold, they're not suited for our environment. Right, if that makes sense. So every mm. country, so and most of the things are made in the West, and the temperature, the conditions there, climatic conditions in the West and you know in the East, things like that, right? They are very much different from Africa. In Africa, we have got great weather, we've got great you know conditions, right? So we don't really need so much, you know. We only need a little bit to top up what we already have, right? So mm -hmm. I've noticed if we start making it you know, for Africans, you know, for Zimbabwe, for are using uh, Zimbabwe's climatic conditions or any other country's climatic conditions, we can actually make a better product, better suited to us. And then obviously it would be cheaper because it's made locally. So that's our vision. And that's why we decided to not just buy off the shelf, but actually, you know, create, uh, fail again, that word again, and then, mm. uh, make it better until we reach a stage where we can offer you, if you come and say you want this, we can offer you something with a 100% guarantee that it would work in your area, how you want it to. Wow, yeah, this is this is really interesting. And um, oh yeah, just out of curiosity, you know, what stage are you at with the technology? Are you and there's still the concept prototype? Have you built one version, one of it? Like what stage are you at with all that tech? So it's been about uh, two years now since uh, we've been doing the technology side of it, right? So right now we've mm -hmm. installed the sensors. So we've passed the monitoring stage. So there's the monitoring stage, there's the automation stage, and then obviously the testing and refining stage. So right now we've passed the monitoring stage. We can now monitor our greenhouses and you know uh, the variables can come to our dashboards and stuff like that. So the nice thing also is it keeps records. 
So you can actually go and check two months ago on this day, what was the temperature, etc, etc, right? And then now we have uh, only recently started the automation. We are working on the automation systems now on, you know, uh, that's a bit more complex now and it'll take a bit more time, but that's the stage we're at now in terms of, you know, installing fans in the grow houses, the humidifiers, etc., uh, automatic dosing systems. So that's the stage we are at uh, currently. Wow, wow, wow. This is amazing. This is, you know, we're talking about innovation within the continent, you know, sourcing materials, building within the continent, adding value within the continent, within Zimbabwe more specifically. Um, and this this is exactly what we need. You know, we need more people uh, coming back to their countries, um, investing in their countries, you know, creating so we can all, you know, reduce the importation and start producing ourselves. So um, this has been an amazing story um, from, from your history, you know, moving from China and, and trying different things to where you are right now. And I, I hope that, you know, many people listening um, will be inspired and possibly, you know, look to partner with you because, you know, there's a lady that does apples in Kenya and she sells the apples in Nigeria yeah. as well. So, you know, you never know people in Nigeria could want to learn more about hydroponic farming and stuff like that. So um, really, really appreciate um, your time today. Um, and just before we kind of wrap up, um, can you give people um, what's, your, what's your website or your Instagram or social media handle so people can follow you? Oh, okay. Uh, again, before I get there, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity to share our story. Uh, we appreciate it any and when you run a business or any and every small chance matters to get your, you know, your message out there. So we really do thank you for this. It was a, and it was a good chat also, <laughs> you know, like I said, yeah. I've been watching a lot of videos and we've been uh, <clears throat> also learning a lot from those videos. So hopefully someone can also learn you know something from uh, our video today and in terms of uh communication our website is www.myvitagrow.com so that's my then vitagrow.com so also you're on instagram facebook linkedin and all our accounts are just my vitagrow so if you just search my then vitagrow then it should come up and then uh you can uh, if you want to email us you can email us on hello at myvitagrow.com and then we can reply you and you know assist however we can brilliant brilliant thank you so much um this like you said it's been actually not just you know a great conversation but a, a great chat as well you know just getting to know what you guys are doing and um it's been a great first zimbabwean episode so thank you for blessing us with that one honor and um yeah we'll definitely be keeping in touch uh maybe when i come to zimbabwe i want to check out your farms as well so Definitely, I think, definitely. Um, I'll thank also come to Nigeria. <laughs> for sure, for sure. You're always more than welcome. More than welcome. Um, brilliant. Awesome. So awesome. thanks, thanks again, and uh, have a lovely day. Same to you. Thank you. All right. Bye.